Is it unfair to judge people and actions in the past by today's standards, by the standards of today? Let's just ask the question, was Thomas Jefferson a racist? <laughs> Here, here's a harder question. Can I still watch Dave Chappelle specials? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, how do we how do we deal with this? You know, how do how do you all think what do you what are your thoughts about this particular question? You know, how do we judge historical actors given what we know today? Anybody have thoughts about that? This is probably less of a direct instructional question and much more of a, a thematic conversation that we have with ourselves as educators. So, yeah, go ahead. I don't actually let my students use the word racist. Hmm. Okay. Um, one of the things that I have found is that when a student calls something racist, I have seen it meant that they did not have to engage with what I was asking them to engage with. Hmm. So they could not say, oh, that's racist, it is bad, so therefore I don't have to, to talk about this. So I don't let them say that because, okay, it's racist. Why are we looking at it then? What, why am I asking you to do this? And it, I've had mixed results. I've had students walk out of a classroom um, I've had other students say that I'm making things unnecessarily hard, but then I've also had students who sort of came to it from a place where I didn't know that this was bad, mm. or this was something that, that reinforced institutionalized problems. Um, so it's difficult because they want to, it's, it's kind of in my head, it's, same thing as saying all Nazis are evil, so I don't have to think about why they were evil. Mm. Um, and it's it's a mixed bag. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. But it also means that um, I'm I'm pushing them beyond where they're comfortable, mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't like that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's a good, really that's a like good strategy. That. Yeah, and I and and I I'm not as uh, adept with it as you are, Lisa. One of the places that I find myself is demanding that students not use words like we and they. You know, not really sure who the we is, not who really sure who the they was, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I've had the luxury of teaching, uh, you know, issues of race to a predominantly black class, a relatively mixed class, and then a predominantly white class. And those are all very different experiences. And I don't know that I can say that one is better than the other. I think if I had to choose, I'd prefer a more diverse class because you get more diverse opinions. I found that on either end, the, the predominantly black class can, can be dominated by a few voices and a predominantly white class can be dominated by a few voices. I found that the, the mixed classroom provides the most interesting landscape to explore some of these topics. And of course, we don't always get the luxury of having that experience. And I've only had that experience a very few times, but it, it has been, uh, for me, it, it made for a richer classroom experience because folks can't get into the we's and the days. Folks can't get into their camps as easily. And it also provides a little more room for uh, students who might have dissenting opinions from their peers to, to find some colleagues or some build some coalitions with folks who, who think a little bit more like them somewhere in the middle of some of those topics. One thing that I uh, picked up from a professor at Marquette when, um, like Lisa said, you know, how do we engage the students and, you know, to, to talk about these topics in a certain way. And one professor said, you know, think of the why, had the students think of the why not just this event happened with this group of people. Okay, but let's go beyond that. How did it get to that point? Why did it get to that point? And to understand the why, we have to understand, you know, what influences are they having? What is their mindset? What is their mentality? And when we start putting all those pieces together, not saying it makes any sort of justification for it, but understanding how one gets to that point can be really great in having an understanding of the overall 
conversation because then it's not just, I think you're wrong and that's that. It's okay, you have these influences. Now I understand how I can better uh, have a conversation with you. And another way uh, the, a different professor did with her class, and I haven't had the chance to do it with any students yet, but I do think it is a really great exercise is we have to understand that when we look back at the past and we're looking back at history and we're explaining it, we're explaining it from the viewpoint of we essentially know what happened, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, when history is in the moment, take for instance right now coronavirus or the protests that are going on nationwide, you know, a couple big issues, what's going to happen in the next month? We don't know because that hasn't become history yet. That's still our future. And at one point in time, when all these events are going on, it's not history. It's the present. It's still the future for them. And so what she did to, uh, to illustrate that is she took newspapers. And so each week in their class, they had a newspaper from that week. They couldn't go any further. They just had that week. And they had to respond to, okay, what's going on? This is the information they have available to them at that time. I mean, this is from like the 1850s or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and so she said, okay, put yourself in your shoes. This is the only, only information you have available to you at that time. What, how do you make sense of the world around you? And I think when we take ourselves out of now, transport ourselves back and understand their world, the way they're looking at it, we can start to see how, okay, maybe this is what they were thinking, or this is what they were engaging with. And I think it really helps to put it into perspective from their point of view versus our point of view. And, you know, Brian, that's a really good point. And Brian, you, you, you sort of earmarked that very effectively. Uh, we do have to teach students to question both. Absolutely, to Keisha's point. Uh, we absolutely do have to teach them to question both. And that gets us to, or gets us back to, the importance of the document. You know, debate the document. The document is the, is the place of debate, which helps uh, to sidestep some of the subjectivity. Um, we, we can't emphasize enough the importance of the document, the, the text of the document. The, uh, I like to use law and policy. You know, if you want to talk about slavery, use the slave codes. The, the slave codes tell us all we need to know about the institution. It, touch, it teaches us about how heinous the, the institution was. It teaches us how people resisted the institution. It teaches about the, the economics of the institution. You know, those, those documents are going to always be valuable. And I'll, I'll also say that for those of us who have the ability to do so, engage archivists and librarians in our classroom development, in our course development, so that uh, we're using not only materials that we find valuable, but the archivists and the librarians, they, they, have, they are sitting on troves of information. And, and I found that they have amplified my classroom experience to places that I, I couldn't take them had I not been in touch with them. And I, and, and I do mean, and I, I do mean to suggest to, to engage them with course development. Long before you get in the classroom, sit down with some folks who have access to a wide array of documents to help think through how to carefully place materials into the classroom uh, schedule as, as best as possible. I mean, maybe to send, I, maybe I'm saying the same thing I said before when you suggested the importance of bringing local experts into the room. And I'm kind of also synthesizing how Kristen was responding to Lisa is that I, I often, I, I say this, that the, the bookshelf of Milwaukee is missing most of the books because, you know, the, in the avenues of how that kind of literature gets created, the, a huge swath of what the real narrative of the place is never had access to those levers of power. And therefore, oftentimes, I'm not saying they're totally devoid of them, but the archives will be missing sometimes, like, you know, that they won't have total fidelity to all that happened. Um, so I guess that that's just a piece that I've been feeling, you know, I, Milwaukee almost feels like an anti-archival city, city to me sometimes, and maybe that's just me being a curmudgeon. Uh, but it, it does feel like a place that, that is in the constant, 
process of forgetting its past and almost proudly so. And, and therefore, and not just, I'm not just saying that interpretively, but I think in, in practice, we do not archive that well. But well, the, the very I'm process not, of yeah. urban renewal does that. You yes, know, very, The very process absolutely. of uh, urban redevelopment is yes. in some ways a, a structural effort to redo, forget, renew the past. Unroot. Unroot, yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. And, and there were a couple of points that I think were, were really important. You know, the, the, the importance of encouraging students to think about the future and think about a future that they imagine. You know, what, what is the future that, what does the future need to look like? Which necessarily, Luis, gets us into this question about what has changed or not. It's tempting to, on the one hand, inflate progress, and it's also attempt, uh, attempting to um, sort of shortchange progress as well. You know, and somewhere in the, in the middle is a sweet spot where we can then have some really good debates. Also, sure. um, one last classroom idea, the debates. Yeah. You know, maybe the one way to, to do this is to structure actual debates for some students to be on the darker side of history, because there is something about learning and thinking through what would be, for, for lack of a better term, what, what were the oppressors up to? What went into the thought process of creating uh, systemic mechanisms of oppression? I mean, yeah, I mean. As you get to think about how to undo them. You put power in the room kids are going to start grabbing for it, you know, like, uh, John, I have that book in my car, Milwaukee Streets, uh, the stories behind their names. To the point I was just mentioning, one of the top first names you'll see in there is Auer. I think his first name is Louis, Louis Auer. He was a school board member long ago. But what it doesn't mention in that book, and here's what the archive leaves out, is that he was a eugenicist. And uh, a, a major street in Milwaukee, Auer Avenue is named after him. And there's a school on that that that's predominantly African American day African American today that uh carry his name and I was talking to some students about that and then we were talking about what a eugenicist is and one of the kids said to me I think he would really hate that this school was full of happy black kids and I was like great point sorry of course he would and then, and think about, <laughs> but also think about all those great funding agencies Ford Foundation Carnegie Foundation I don't think that those industrialists of the late 19th, oh, yeah, early 20th absolutely. century intended for their money to be used <laughs> to fight apartheid and to yeah. fight Jim Crow. <laughs> Especially since they built them. <laughs> they built those systems, you know? Yeah. All right, Adam, we better wrap these folks up. Um, let's go ahead to the, the last slide. Folks, we thank you for your time tonight. We hope that we at least had a chance to uncover uh, some conversations and some thoughts that might be useful. We'll continue to do these at the end of every month. As you see there in June, we're gonna talk about Latinx history in Milwaukee. And then in July, we're gonna get into Milwaukee food and culture, given our current state of affairs with COVID, we might not have all the, the wonderful festivals that we're used to in the city. Uh, and then in August, we're gonna get into voting rights, but we will continue to have at the end of the month, these kinds of conversations to help us think through how to do our jobs as educators and how to continually engage our young people as effectively as we possibly can. Before we wrap up, does anybody have anything they'd like to share? Any last comments, any last chats, any last statements? Rob, turn your video on. Man, it's dark out here, brother. <laughs> I, I want to see how dark. You can't see me. Oh. Yeah. So, Rob, can you tell us a ghost story? <laughs> well, before he does that, let me tell them about the, the June. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's Sorry, sure we, we forgot. We, for, we just went into our normal routine. <laughs> so for June, uh, it will be starting June 10th is the uh, first one for the, the digital series, which is a monthly summer series that we have been doing. Uh, but like they said, you know, at the end of the month, we will have the table talks. So uh, my email is there at the bottom. So if you want to join these on the weekly basis, uh, in addition to the table talks, Go ahead and shoot me an email and we can make sure that you are invited to these. They've been great. The attendance has been excellent for each week and it's each week takes on its own sort of personality, but there's so much 
in uh, each of the talks, a lot of resources. Everyone that comes as an attendee has great comments, a lot of book suggestions, uh, also articles and uh, different suggestions for resources that you could all use in a classroom. Uh, no matter what grade you're, you're teaching, it's all adaptable. So these are really great informative uh, sessions, not just about history, but how to understand it, how to teach it, and really engaging with each other as well, too. You know, Rob calls them, he, he says this, and I love the, the analogy, is that they're kind of like pick up basketball a little bit, but um, better than the course at Washington Park, because Rob was saying that their uh, skill level's not that high there. You know, <laughs> actually, what I was saying was that if the young guys are going to go out and play basketball during a the pandemic. They better make it worth it. <laughs> you know, you mean to tell me you came out here to play basketball and wish your health with that jump shot? <laughs> <laughs> You you have to heckle them at the court, not I in this them, Zoom. Absolutely. Not in this Zoom job. talk. You're a That's coward. A my job is to heckle them. Absolutely. <laughs> like you out here without a mask with that broke jumper. Um, we we also <laughs> included in the chat there the Facebook page where you can see all of the previous discussions from uh, our May series. So you can go to that Facebook page and find those as well. All right, you should point out to them it will be their last dance. They're going to get COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, if you happen to have right away the curriculum um, website loaded up, if you could drop that in the chat, uh, chat that would be. Uh, she had it. Uh, okay, she did cool. it already. Just like that. Yep. Cool. Well, we thank you all for joining. Um, we will wrap up here. I'll stop the recording and we'll hang out here in the event. Folks want to chat a little bit more for a few minutes without the recording. So the recording has...